This is a follow-up to an earlier video about ship defense against attack by a TV-guided surface drone where an operator uses a video feed from the drone to guide it to hit the ship. The basic idea in the previous video was to fit a ship with a jammer able to break the operator's control link so the drone becomes unguided and thereafter kind of follows a random path determined by the effect of surface waves. This effectively creates a protection bubble around the ship inside of which the operator can't guide the drone. Now I think it's worth talking about in this video how one might practically go about designing a jammer to protect a ship against drone attack. And by that I mean, for the, the context of this video, I mean the, the specifying three parameters for the jammer. The jammer antenna gain, the jammer transmitter power, and the height of the jammer antenna above the mean sea surface in order to achieve uh, some kind of performance specification which might be, for example, that the jammer must prevent the drone from, from successfully attacking the ship 98 times out of 100 with, let's say, 95% confidence. And the 95% confidence part is important. What that means is, suppose we try sending, a, suppose we consider a trial where 100 drones are sent to attack the ship, then 98 of those must fail, and we'll allow two for statistical, you know, no more than two to be successful. The 95% confidence part is where, let's suppose we repeat this experiment of 100 drones 20 times. In 19 of those 20 trials, no more than two drones can get through. On the, night, on the 20th trial, okay, we'll allow something more than uh, uh, two to get through. That's what 95% confidence means. So what this video is, is a broad strokes description of the methodology that I would use to determine just those three parameters, as limited scope, just to, to illustrate the principles, uh, to achieve a specific uh, performance specification. Now, are there other ways to go about doing this? Absolutely. Uh, this is just my approach, and it's not in textbooks, and it's not my second best to guess. So this is the right way to do it in my in my opinion there could be other right ways to do it as well so there are nine steps there's nothing complicated here it's uh, it's as simple as a truck but it does involve a series of connected uh, connected ideas um, first by way of background let's step back and have a look at what's actually happening in the attack the drone is zipping along the sea surface uh, like a speedboat it's physically interacting with the surface waves um, the drone sends a video signal to an operator somewhere on land or nearby uh, and it receives guidance commands from the operator. Turn left, turn right, throttle up, throttle down, at least that much. Maybe telemetry is coming back too. From a jamming standpoint, the drone is a weapon system with two parts, an operator and a vehicle. The system has two vulnerabilities to RF jamming. The first is the operator's video receive channel. In other words, back where the operator is located, there's a receiver that receives a video signal from the drone. And the second vulnerability is the drone's guidance receive channel, the, the receiver on board the drone that uh, receives signals from the operator. Now, for illustration purposes, let's jam the drone's receive channel. Uh, since the closer the drone gets to the ship, the stronger the jamming signal is, and broadly speaking, the weaker the control signal is in the drone's guidance channel if it's getting further away from the operator's transmitter. Uh, now, depending on, on the, how the power levels shake out, the jammer might also shut down the operator's video link, but for expediency in the video, we'll just ignore that. Okay, still in background mode uh, here, never mind how the jamming signal works in the drone. Let's just say that if the jamming to signal ratio, or that's the J to S, also called the J to S ratio, is sufficiently high, then the drone can't receive guidance commands, so it's unguided. And there's no need to get bogged down on what the drone does uh, if the guidance signal is lost, but that's potentially important. Like maybe it uses gyros or something and it holds its heading or it... Uh, holds the last commanded uh, turn rate, who knows, it doesn't matter for this illustration. So to figure out if the effect, the, out the effect of jamming on the drone, we need a way to calculate how powerful the two signals are in the receiver. The first signal is the jamming signal from the ship, and, the, and let's call that the forward link, and the, control, wait, the second is the control signals from the operator, and let's call that the aft link. The strength of the jamming signal in the drone depends on the distance from the ship to the drone, on the effective radiated power or ERP of the jammer, 
on the effect of sea surface reflections, which is called propagation, and finally on the gain of the drone's receive antenna. And it's the same deal between the drone and the operator to calculate the strength of the guidance command signal. Now those are the two things that are competing against each other and we want the jammer signal to win. Now as far as what the jamming does, let's say that whenever the you know, jamming signal, as I mentioned, is let's say 6 dB or higher, or pick any number, then the, the guidance signal is, is blocked, so the drone just wanders around according to the effect of the waves. If the J2S is less than the threshold value, the drone is guided. It's important to understand that reflections on the sea surface cause both the jamming signal and the guidance signal to fluctuate in the drone's receiver according to the position of the drone on the sea surface. That means that as the drone approaches the ship, there will be a kind of a ratty edge where, of performance where the jamming signal works intermittently before at closer range we expect it to consistently work or mostly consistently work. This ratty edge will have a statistical mean distance from the ship and a, a, range a statistical range variation like a depth. And by the way, this is exactly like protecting troops against roadside bombs by using a, an RCIED, a radio-controlled IED jammer. An IED jammer creates a protection bubble, a so-called protection bubble around itself, so that no bomb can be triggered inside the protection zone. In exactly the same way as described, I just mentioned for the ship, and the, and the surface drone in exactly that way. And for the same reasons, the area around an RCIED jammer can be divided into three zones. A green, let's call it a green protected zone, which we'd also have around the ship, a yellow warning zone, which is like a ring around the green zone, and a red unsafe zone, which is everywhere else. So for an IED jammer protecting uh, troops or a, a drone protecting a ship, it's the same thing. Now, what's the practical use of that information? Well, there are several, and the most obvious one is to cognitively plan the number of jammers and their placement in order to protect assets, where the jammer could be fitted to a ship or to a mobile drone even, either airborne or surface. And if it's, that's done correctly, it is not necessary to fit every ship with a jammer. And that saves money in about a dozen different ways. Anyway, to continue, boiling all this down, what it really means is that we can define the ECM effectiveness transition range by a mean value, a mean range, or mean range to the middle of the protection range, and a width, or a range depth, where the depth sets the confidence interval by the area it encloses under the transition's probability density curve. Okay, I'm going to describe now a methodology by which we can accomplish a couple of things. And by methodology, I mean a, se a set of procedural steps that we follow to do whatever it is that we want to do. The first thing that the methodology could be used for is to evaluate a single counter drone jammer design, where what I mean by design is in a limited sense uh, that I've already set up. We want to pick three things, the jammer antenna gain, the jammer transmitter power, and the height of the jammer antenna above the mean sea surface. And we're going to roll the first two, the antenna gain and the transmitter power, into a single number called the effective radiated power, which is a normal thing to do. Now, the second thing that the methodology can be used for is to find a design, a counter drone jammer design, which meets an agreed performance specification, or to determine that the agreed performance specification is not achievable. Now, what else could we use the methodology for? A couple of things come to mind. For example, uh, it's a way to score, or if you had to do a procurement, it's a way to score candidate procurement options. In other words, which ones perform, if any of them, perform an agreed performance specification. It's a way of objectively, transparently, and uh, clearly uh, uh, scoring uh, 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 procurement options, or rather a lot of money might be involved. The other op uh, uh, application for the, uh, for the methodology is to, um, if new information becomes available, such as a new drone threat appears, how do we change an existing, already procured piece of equipment to counter the new threat? Or do we need to change it at all? And the fact is, new information is always becoming available and new threats always appear. So arguably, the last uh, application, the third application, and there are others, might be the most important. So here are the steps I'd follow, and, and this isn't the last word, it just want to illustrate the principles.